afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Career STEM Role Models webinar this afternoon. Today, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Rosalind Hickson, but as we gather for this meeting from different places around Australia, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from which we meet. I'm joining you today from Ngunnawal and Ngambri land. I pay respect to Elders past and present and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who join us online today. As we share and discuss our own knowledge and practices, we acknowledge the deep knowledge forever embedded in custodianship of country. We're really pleased that you're able to join us today because we're going to be hearing from a fantastic scientist, but I did want to let you know that the session is being recorded as it would have notified you. And so we will be making it available on the Stella YouTube channel in a couple of days if you want to relive the joy. There is also a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. If you have any questions at any time during the webinar, you can pop them in there and we'll either hit them up when we're, while we're talking, if it's relevant, or we will definitely have a Q&A session at the end. So don't have to hold on to them to the end. Anything burning, put it in there and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, otherwise, you can wait and ask them at the end in the Q&A spot. Uh, there is a chat function, but I will be looking at the Q&A. So if you have a question, that's where we want them to go. Uh, and at the end, you will be sent a survey for feedback on this. And it's really a great way for us to know what's working, what's not, and what you'd like to hear in the future sessions, because we will be running these into next year. So we've got two more after today, this year, and then into term one next year. Uh, and we also sent out a worksheet. So if you didn't receive that, please get in touch with Stellar Admin and we can forward that to you because it's a little bit of expansion on Rosalind's work. So now let's get into the actual webinar and I'd like to invite Dr. Rosalind Hickson to talk with you now about her STEM career journey. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. Let me just bring up my slides. Okay, you should be seeing that now. Um, so I'm going to be talking about what I do, but I'm also going to be talking about how I got to where I am now. And kind of the overarching theme of my talk today is that nobody really knows where they're going to end up. Um, and I'll, I'll talk you through that a bit more. So this is basically my life on a slide. Um, I've condensed it a bit, as you can imagine. I started out high school in a semi-rural area in New South Wales. I didn't realize until I moved to Canberra for university that it wasn't normal to have pigs and chickens and occasional cattle on the school grounds. I thought that was just what, what you had so that you could learn about agriculture better and see how chickens were hatched and raised and so on. Um, so my hobbies I've also got throughout here, which is why I called it my life on a slide, just to point out that uh, us scientists do things not just science too. So in high school, I was very into karate and flute and piano uh, for my hobbies. To go to university, I really needed a scholarship to get there because the closest university that did anything technical uh, was a four hour drive away, which is a bit far to commute every day. So the best scholarship that I could find was to join the Defence Force. So I joined the Royal Australian Air Force and went through ADFA, the Australian Defence Force Academy. And because my career advisor, I'm first generation university, which means that none of my parents will and anybody really in my extended family had been to university before. The only people I knew who'd been to university were my teachers. And they said, oh, you're good at maths, go study engineering. So that's what I did. I went and did an electrical engineering degree. Um, and I continued my hobbies, but when you're in a marching band, no one can hear the flute. So I did piccolo instead, which is just a small flute. After I was graduating that though, I sort of didn't really know what to do, but I remembered that my favorite math lecturer kept telling these great stories of these real world problems that they went and worked on and solved, including one where he helped make sure that your chocolate biscuits don't go white after too long by optimizing the amount of cocoa and things they put in it. So I was just like, well, that sounds fun. It sounds like you can use this math to do all sorts of really fun things. And that really attracted me. So I went and did a PhD with him and I didn't even really know what a PhD was when I went and knocked on his door and said, how do I get to where you are? But he talked me through it and he 
got me a scholarship and I did the first year of my PhD in invasive weeds. So all of those pest weeds that you have to pull up from your backyard, well, there was a major one coming down um, the major river systems in Australia, the Murray-Darling Basin. And we were trying to help predict where it would be so that they could like, stop it from spreading before it got there because it's really expensive to remove. Um, but I ended up actually looking at heat and mass transport through steel coils or how long does it take to like get these steel coils up to a minimum temperature and then slowly cool them back down and you might think that these are really unrelated topics but actually the mathematics was the same so you know one of the talks that I sometimes give is what do invasive weeds and steel coils have in common and the answer is the mass after that um, I was looking around for jobs and the Australian National University had advertised a position at the National Centre for Epidemiology and Population Health. And I walked into that interview and I said, I know nothing about biology. I did electrical engineering. I know nothing about infectious diseases, but what I can do is solve any type of differential equation that's solvable. A, a differential equation is just a type of math. Um, and they said, yeah, great. We've got the epidemiologists, we've got the medical doctors, we've got the health economists and the biostatisticians. What we need is somebody who can do that type of maths. So that's how I started getting into infectious disease modeling back in 2010, or I guess you could say before it was cool because COVID wasn't around yet. Uh, from there, I went to the University of Newcastle and did quite a lot of lecturing. So teaching first year mathematics and applied mathematical modeling. I did some research looking at transmission of a disease called tuberculosis from Papua New Guinea to Australia. And we showed that under no circumstances should a certain decision be made. And then that decision was the one that was made. And I said, uh, how do I get my foot in the door to be talking to policymakers and convincing people that my research should be taken seriously and not just be published in papers. So I went to IBM, which yes, is a computer company who at the time was investing very heavily in health and health research. And I said, infectious diseases are really a really important part of health. So we should have a team looking at infectious diseases. And they, they believed me and we started doing pandemic preparedness systems from 2014 to 2018. Um, unfortunately, as companies do, they changed their strategic direction uh, and that stopped, which was two years too soon, I would say. But then I went to the University of Melbourne and started doing some malaria modeling, which is another disease that spreads a lot through Southeast Asia and, and Africa and the world. Um, but we were working with Cambodia in particular and informing their policies and how they might reach elimination of malaria more quickly. Then the position that I have now is advertised. So you know, I went, bounced between universities and IBM, went back to university and was looking around and thinking what, what it would be great is if I could sit across both. And lo and behold, CSIRO and James Cook University said, what we really need is somebody to sit across both the university sector and CSIRO to be doing that really applied translational, translational work, like you know, impacting the real world and making a difference, changing things, I guess you could say. Um, and so they had said, we, we want somebody with experience in both and it was a perfect fit. Um, apparently walking in and saying, this is my dream job is a good way of getting a job. So tip for people, but it was, the combination of my maths background that meant that I'm like flexible around what I can apply for. I've worked across all sorts of diseases, like tuberculosis, dengue. I did a bit of influenza in here, um, malaria, uh, a bit of Ebola, and now a lot of COVID and something called Nipah, which is transmitted from bats to humans, sometimes via pigs. Uh, it's my flexibility with that really strong maths and coding background that has let me do this and my experience. So my non-linear career trajectory. 
And I had no idea that this job would exist back when I was in high school or even before it was advertised in 2019. So, so now I tell you a bit more about what I do. So why were they interested in studying emerging infectious diseases and keeping in mind that this job was advertised before COVID? Before COVID, we knew it was a matter of time before one of the diseases that crossed from animals to humans would result in a global outbreak or a pandemic. And why did we know it was a matter of when, not if? Well, here's a history of diseases that almost did it since 2009. Um, in 2009, something called swine flu crossed from pigs to humans, and we thought it was going to be a big global disaster, but we got really lucky because there was actually prior immunity in populations that were vulnerable. Uh, then, as you can see, all of these other diseases, oh, this pangolin shouldn't be there. We've since shown since I first made the slide that it, it probably wasn't pangolin. That should be bat to question mark to human because we don't know what the intermediate species was, the, the animals that it, it infected in the meantime. So according to what we know, there are more than five new emerging infectious diseases every year. Not all of those have pandemic potential, but that's still something that we, we need to be looking at seriously. And from here, I thought I'd take a little bit of a step back and say, I've told you that I'm an applied mathematician and that what I do is mathematical modeling, but I thought I should talk you through what that is. So what it's not is in the comic on the right. Uh, what it's not is walking equations up and down a catwalk. Um, but what it is, is taking some real world system and simplifying it down to the most essential elements that exist. And so if you know what a caricature is, which is a comic that's like a, a representation that you can recognize based on just simple features, models are caricatures. Um, if you don't know what a caricature is, I recommend looking it up, it's a very good word. And there's a trade-off between any reality and complexity and understanding. So, there's a saying by a statistician called George Box that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So what I try to do is make sure that I do useful modeling that's useful to the real world. And it always then make, means that I have to go back and say, now, given what we're modeling, given what our results show, does it make sense? Does it actually look like the real world? If not, what have I got wrong? And cycle that way. I'd like to point out that we all use modeling on an everyday basis. We all have mental models of all sorts of things and the mathematical modeling is just formalizing this in a mathematical sense. So you've all used, I reckon, a map before to navigate somewhere. Um, so there was maps and cartography as far back as at least 150 AD and probably earlier. I reckon you've all jumped onto Google Maps to find directions of how to get somewhere. This typical projection of what's actually an almost not quite sphere onto a 2D surface has to make some simplifying assumptions though. So we're used to looking at the world through a certain map that doesn't look quite like this. Um, but when you actually think about, and it's called the Mercator projection, by the way, from that globe onto a 2D surface, it doesn't matter that we've lost the actual information and that we haven't preserved the relative areas of continents and so forth, because it still tells us that when we get to this place, we have to turn right, or we get to that place, we have to turn left, and so on. And you've all seen the periodic table as well, and that is another good map that a good model, sorry, that um, you'll use in chemistry that was able to predict things as well. So conceptually what I do is take a population and just bucket people by their disease status. So if you're susceptible to being infected by COVID or influenza or dengue or malaria or, or any pathogen that you might be interested in, any disease, then you say you know, th those people are able to be infected or they're susceptible. And then you say, after like some interaction with somebody who is infectious, 
then that susceptible person might themselves then become infectious. But this interaction here is required for that movement to happen. And then after some period of time for things like coronavirus, you don't stay infectious forever, you recover and are immune and so you're no longer able to infect other people. So fundamentally, that's, that's what I do. And I just wanna write for those of you who are a bit further along in your studies, this is how we write this down mathematically. And don't be too worried. We like to use Greek letters just because it's fun. Um, but all this left-hand side here is saying is that we wanna track how this changes through time. So these are all just about how does this change in time? How does our number of susceptible change in time? How does our number of infectious change through time? And how does our number of removed or recovered change through time? Um, and, and that's all that's saying. So a really quick case study here, and this is some work that my team and I did with Transport for New South Wales should masks be worn on public transport? So hopefully you can see here that there's a little train that's coronavirus. Can we, how will it impact coronavirus was, was really the question here. So conceptually what happens in our model is that somebody can get onto a train. There might be some susceptible people shown as these blue figures here. There might be some immune people. If this infectious person gets onto the train, then they might expose these people. Um, expose means that after some period of time, they will themselves become infectious. Um, and they might also, hopefully you can see there, infect the, the surfaces on the train as well. And so even when, and, and this, by the way, these people, it's called same place, same time, because the infectious person infected them when they were all in the same area at the same time. But then after those people get off the train, sometime later, some other susceptible person might get on the train. And because the surfaces are all contaminated, they might become exposed and later become infected as well, or the same place, different time. So conceptually, that's what's happening for the transmission for our model, either direct from other people or from the surfaces or fomites, you may have heard. And we can capture this using this mathematical expression here. This is just saying the probability that that susceptible person becomes exposed is equal to the one minus the probability that they weren't infected from a, um, the surfaces times all of the probabilities that they weren't infected by all of the potential infectious person who came onto that train. And this is a nice probability trick that we have because the, the one minuses let us do that multiplication. So if you haven't got to probability yet, let me just say that there's a lot of application of probability throughout real world as well. And then because we need to then capture what's happening on the trains, we have to have a, a model of the train network. So this is the train network in Sydney and we know where every train is through time I have estimates of the number of passengers on those trains at any point in time. And we know how much disease is in the community because we have uh, that SIR type model for the community. And then we couple those two. So we say, well, we know how many people are likely to get onto a train infectious. And then we know how likely they are to be infected on that train because of our model. And then we can start looking at these outputs. So this is all done in computer simulation using this probabilistic expression. And the key result here, by the way, is that if you're on public transport, especially in an area that's known to have COVID, you should wear a mask. So this is looking at seven simulated days uh, and total new infections on a train. So if there are no masks, you get this average and 95% confidence interval because it's all random or stochastic, as we like to say. But if every single person on that train is wearing at least a two cloth mask and properly, so nose covered and everything, then within seven days, and in fact, within five days, we see a statistically significant reduction in number of new infections. So this is quite substantial. And the point at where you just get a little bit of statistical significance in our seven day horizon is 80%. 
So at least 80% of passengers on public transport need to be wearing a mask properly and you'll see a substantial difference. I would like to say though, that um, COVID isn't just all, about, uh, sorry, um, stopping COVID isn't just all about masks. This is the so-called Swiss cheese model of public health. So yes, another type of model. Um, and it's just showing that everything that we do like, is not perfect in how it might stop the spread. But if we have enough different layers and if those holes don't line up, then we should be able to prevent transmission. So wear your mask, but also get vaccinated, adhere to lockdowns, except like do your physical distancing and all of those other things are important too. So coming back to this, um, what do you need for a career in modeling or research? Well, I would say you need the ability to do computer programming to code. I would say you need a really good maths foundation. So, you know, study maths. And for an undergraduate degree, depending what it is that you want to study, then you need to make sure that your high school subjects really line up. And if you do the right subjects in high school, it makes your university life a lot easier and smoother. Um, and if you want a career in research, you typically need to do a PhD. So most people think that a career looks like this really smooth trajectory where you, you go up through the positions and things, but real life looks much more like a random walk. And the, like the positioning and size of these don't mean anything. I just wanted it to look like a random walk, but this has been my career and I, I've hopped around between universities and industry, between different levels between being a manager or not. Um, and I'm really happy with where I am right now. As I said, yeah, I have my dream job and it's really good. So just to sum up, because I have reached the 20 minutes, um, my take home message is that mass really does underpin a lot of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths. Um, and you should try to study as much math as you can which doesn't necessarily mean the highest level you have to take into account everything else that you're doing, but study as much math as you can. Don't forget to do computer science because everything's on computers now. But another thing that I would say, like you know, if I had to give some advice to my high school self is it's never too late to change. Don't stop learning. There's always interesting things out there to do. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're going backwards in your career because you might end up in the position of your dreams. Um, so I like my job, but I just want to reiterate that I'm, I'm more than just my job. I, I have quite a few hobbies and I enjoy doing those as well. So thank you very much. All got to have hobbies. <laughs> yeah. That's not particularly good too. <laughs> that was a really great yeah, talk about, I mean, everything was maths there. It's, it's just, you know, you wouldn't think it, but the maths is hiding out everywhere. <laughs> and I yep. like that kind of modelling. I prefer that to the catwalks. I think <laughs> it's much better. <laughs> <laughs> um, you did at the end there mention a little bit about your, your high school self. Uh, and I wanted to kind of tap into that and say, when you were at high school, was there something else you thought you would be? <laughs> or th or something well, I thought I was to going to be an engineer. <laughs> um, yeah, I thought that I was going to be an engineer until about two months before I graduated engineering. So it wasn't even just throughout high school. Um, but nothing um, was wasted in the engineering degree, though, was no, it? No, absolutely not. So everything... In fact, the engineering degree set me up really well because um, it had a lot of computing in it as well. It was essentially all modeling the real world and thinking about how do I take that physics and chemistry and knowledge of whatever that engineering system is and write it down mathematically and solve it, but always with a mind for how is this going to be used and useful. So I actually, my favorite introduction to a talk once was when someone introduced me, they said, like all good applied mathematicians, Rosalind started out life in engineering. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say you have to go study an engineering degree. You could do a maths major and make sure you get the programming and whatever the field specific knowledge is of whatever it is that you want to be applying your maths to. 
yeah um, it's just that mine happened to be physics and that works really well yes and um do you still play your instruments or do you, has that left um so I actually didn't start learning the sax oh I, I think I missed that saying that but I actually started learning the saxophone after I finished my PhD um so something to do <laughs> Well, yes, but also I would say that if ever you're in a teaching position, it's really useful to start learning something to remind you of the frustration of learning something new for the first time. And, and it helps you stay empathetic with your students. So, um, and I was also doing jazz and improv. And I would say that being able to do good jazz improv is basically about bluffing your way through with confidence. And that works really well in a professional life when you're giving public talks, when you're lecturing, like all of these things, that confident front is really useful too. If I can scat on a, on a saxophone, I can stand up in a lecture theatre. I like that. Yeah. Uh, so kind of when, when you, you, you said you walked into the, the, the other position where you just said, I don't know anything about biology, but I know everything about, about maths. Did you find that you were, um, you know, able to collaborate with a lot of the other guys who knew the things you didn't while you were at ANU? So, yes, but it was definitely a process. Um, early on, I basically needed somebody in the room to help interpret between what I was saying and what they were saying because we didn't have technical language in common. Um, and I know that sounds really funny. We're all speaking English. We're in Australia. But the, the fields of epidemiology have very particular language and jargon and use and mathematics and engineering and computer science all have their own very particular jargon. And we weren't always understanding each other. But as long as you come from a position of mutual respect and be kind, then you'll work your way through that. Um, and now I can be that interpreter. Um, so one way we used to put it is you need to be able to order coffee in the other sciences language. So I can order coffee in biology. I can order coffee in computer science. Uh, I can order coffee in virology and epidemiology and applied mathematics and engineering and so I'm a very useful interpreter. That's very good. Translators in science are always needed. I've heard that. It's like, we need to be able to bridge it. So do you now, um, I know you've worked across a couple, but with the fact that you're working through CSIRO and JCU, are you doing a little bit more collaboration? Are you found that that experience has helped you, yeah, order coffee better yes. now? <laughs> Absolutely. So they needed somebody both with university and industry experience and who could talk across fields because everything they do is incredibly interdisciplinary. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly not only myself collaborating between epidemiologists and medical doctors and computer scientists and data scientists and um, quantitative ecologists and field ecologists and experimental people like you, you name it I'm probably collaborating with them but I can also set up meetings and help other people start those collaborative processes and they needed somebody who could do that as well uh, because my remit is to help set up a collaboration across the broad spectrum of emerging infectious diseases um, and that that needs somebody yeah absolutely and I can't do that all myself and I can't even do that with my team of five people so I just have to make sure that people are talking in the right way to make sure that happens and I've had a mentor here at JCU who's been teaching me to order coffee and social sciences as well um, wow. because those <laughs> behavioral sciences and marketing are absolutely fundamental to all of public health as well. Yeah, as we've seen in the last year, that kind of public messaging and, and being able to tell it to translate to the general public, as they're called these days. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, you're bridging that industry and academia. With, with the time at IBM, did you find it very different to the, the kind of atmosphere there to what it is in academia at, like, say, Newcastle or Uni Melbourne? I would say yes and no. So I would very carefully point out that I was in the research arm of IBM. So I wasn't in like a, an industry job as most people would think of it. I was always still supposed to be writing papers and going to conferences. So in that regard, it was the same. One of the big differences is that, um, and you'll hear academics say this, they want the freedom to choose whatever it is that they want to work on and research about. 
Uh, but the thing is that researchers still have to get grants and external funding, and they still have to look at what are the priority areas for those grants. So I would say working within a private company like IBM, where you do have to make sure you're aligned to the company strategy, is very much analogous in that you say, well, here is the strategy, here's what I can do to help with that. Um, and at the point where they got out of health research, that was where I was like, well, this is no longer a good fit for me. It's time to move on. Time to get out. <laughs> so um, you, you've worked with a couple of different diseases like, like dengue and malaria, which have a very obvious um, animal kind of transfer right. from animals. That's spread by mosquitoes, for those who don't know. Yes. So, oh, fun fact. Only female mosquitoes bite humans. I did find that out this week when I was looking at something else to it <laughs> so there you go so ones but the blokes are the ones that do the buzzing I think someone said they're the ones that are more annoying with the their buzzers are more annoying than women I found so, yep. let's go down some mosquito <laughs> 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 but the, so that, that's a very kind of obvious one and it's not they're not really diseases that are here in Australia are they so you were obviously looking at populations elsewhere um, dengue actually was in Australia at the time that I was modeling it um, it was in Townsville and Cairns, um, which is a coincidence to the fact that I now live in Townsville, by the way, um, <laughs> because I was looking at this when I lived in Canberra and Newcastle. Uh, but they've actually released mosquitoes that are essentially not able to transmit it to humans. Oh, wow. Um, which then is that stopper, isn't it? It's that extra layer in the protections. Yeah. They called it inoculating the mosquitoes, which is a simplification, but close enough. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds like a good with that, Bob. But so have you had, do a lot of your stuff have to be working overseas with people um, with, with how it's transmitted, not just in Australia, but overseas and in other um, countries? So the short answer is yes, because diseases do not respect borders. Um, and we would be silly for those pathogens that are come from overseas into Australia or vice versa. We need to be looking at those regionals and that human movement because human movement is really what drives all infectious disease transmission. Um, but there are pathogens that are mostly just within Australia. Like if you look at Ross River fever, for example, that's a very Australian disease um, that's now all the way down the coast into Melbourne um, and also spread by mosquitoes. Um, yes, so yes. <laughs> so it, it depends on the disease and where it is. Um, so, but so, yes, I enjoy the overseas angle as well. <laughs> Obviously not the traveling lately. But <laughs> well, not lately, but I, I did go to Thailand and go see some of the malaria sites where I was modeling um, so wow. that I better understood. And the reason that that's important is it would not have occurred to me that in Thailand, which is a relatively rich country, in the areas that have malaria, the buildings you can literally see through the walls. And if you can see through the walls, mosquitoes can just fly through the walls. So buildings are not the same there as they are in Australia, which I would not have known unless I travelled there. Yeah, some real world kind of experience on it. I just had a question about that, that kind of travel and things like that. So um, have you, has your work taken you on travel or have you just travelled and happened to make it work with, <laughs> with work? Uh, no, so work has taken me on travel. My, my very first international trips were all for work. I had to get a passport for work. In fact, I started my PhD on the 1st of February and I went to a conference in New Zealand in May. And when I got there, my supervisor started talking about this. I'm like, oh, I'll need to go get one of those um, passport things. And he's like, oh, do it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that takes a little while <laughs> to get okay. Because, I mean, my parents hadn't even been overseas at that point in their lives. So uh, it oh. was very new to international travel. But since then, and that was 2007, I've been to New Zealand, Canada, um, Taiwan, Thailand, Japan, um, the UK, Poland, Spain, the USA, um, all for work and some of those multiple times and was that mostly conferences that you've gone for or was it conferences sometimes? visits um, I actually got flown to the U.S. once to train some people from the Philippines in infectious disease modeling wow a bit weird <laughs> a bit closer I, to I know I did try to point out that it would be cheaper for us to go to Australia but uh, or to send me to the Philippines but sent me to the U.S. <laughs> 
I am in. <laughs> okay, so we've got, we have had someone ask us a question, which has said, uh, what were your high school exam results like? Were you a top student in your academic results in all of it? All? Not in everything. Um, I was um, quite an excellent math student because I loved it. Um, and I would actually go as far back and say, I actually did really badly in maths in primary school. Um, and then got to some different types of maths in high school and quite enjoyed it. And then my grade shifted <laughs> because I enjoyed it more. Uh, and so that, that for me was a type of mathematics in the way of thinking about it. And then when I got to year 11, 12, we started something called calculus. And so, you know, those equations I had under the SIR model, that's yeah. calculus. It's just how things change. Um, and so a lot of my stuff now is how things change with time. Or for those of you in later years, rates of change. It's a <laughs> phrase you'll hear a lot in physics. Um, I, I love calculus and I still love calculus. And that's probably why I've ended up where I am. So I did really well in that. I actually did really well in English. Um, you know, trying to ruin some stereotypes here. <laughs> I did not do so well in chemistry. Chemistry never really clicked for me. Um, and so I overloaded and chemistry, in fact, ended up being a subject that didn't count towards my university entrance school. A bit relieved on that. <laughs> well. so, thank goodness. Yeah, see, I, I liked chemistry, so I'm not going to bag it. <laughs> but, well, it's not that I didn't like it. I, it's just that I, I was it. not a top student, which, yeah. And just, you can't click on everything because I'm, I'm the opposite. Physics just one over my head. <laughs> Yeah, and I did really well in physics too. Yeah, and maths and physics are very close, which is, I think, what a lot of people find. Is, I also did a subject called engineering studies, which oh, wow. I did pretty well on. Yeah, I, I was going to do engineering. Why not? Yeah. Hey, I wish I'd had that, actually. We need, we need more people thinking about it. That Yeah, maths and engineering and physics are very close. Um, there was no programming like course offered at my high school at the time which partly now I'm showing my age, but um, I got to the like, end of high school. I'd asked my high school to put on one of the programming courses and they wouldn't do it because it was just me who wanted to do it. And I should say um, my, my class numbers were small. I was the only one in the highest level of maths. I was one of four in the second highest level of maths. I was one of three in chemistry. I was one of, I think it was 14 in engineering studies and one of I think it was 13 in English um, and physics was six. I was one of six in physics. So we're not talking a big school here. Was it tough to do that maths? You were the only one, like you didn't have other yes. students. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. Um, it? Probably my funniest story from that, though, was normally when you have an exam, the teacher says no talking to other students and lays out a bunch of rules. And my first exam in that subject I looked up 20 minutes and I went, you never told me I couldn't talk. <laughs> and the teacher started like yelling at me. We were, we were very friendly. So like a uh, funny yelling at me, but like a very serious, be quiet. You're in the middle of an exam. This is exam conditions. And these like year seven kids, because I was year 12, like walked past and they all looked horrified into the classroom. And my teacher and I saw them and then burst out laughing. So it could be fun. Have been trying to cheat off yourself. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I think it's it's really lovely, as you say, you know, you tried to, you did a lot of different things and some things worked and some things didn't. Um, if there was something you could work on now that you'd really love to work on, I know you're in your dream job now, so it's very difficult to, to pick that. But if there was something else that you've kind of seen along each other, oh, that'd be a really nice thing. Is there something you would have liked to have worked on? Yeah, more statistics. Um, there was almost no statistics in my degree and that really doesn't make sense because so much of the world is data. Yeah. Um, so I, I would say that I'd wish I had a bit more statistics training. Um. 
I mean, I, I, and I do think that it has become, because I'm going to show my age, when I was, <laughs> when I did a, a science degree a very long time ago, the, the whole, the emphasis on computer science and data science was not as, as big. There was a, a maths component because maths is under everything, but you are finding now that it's been more and more and a lot of people didn't have it when they were finishing high school and it's so is obviously you work in maths and modeling and things so it's a big part of what you do isn't it um it's perhaps not as big a part as you think it might be so like it is still possible to do applied mathematics and not really touch data wow <laughs> so it, it's possible it's not so true in infectious disease modeling especially not really applied infectious disease modeling but if you're doing development of methods for infectious disease modeling you may actually not have very much to do with data at all wow so it's that's, still possible that's a new comment <laughs> a lot of us saying there's data everywhere and um i just wanted to kind of finish up and go when you're watching the news and the about the stats of the covid numbers and the spread and things like that are you finding you're watching it differently to other people and uh, you're reading between yes. the lines a bit more um absolutely and yeah, um, my partner finds it quite funny how often I'm like, that's not quite right of, oh, they've dropped too much of the nuance about that um, and so on. Um, it's like, oh, that's misleading. <laughs> this must be very frustrating. <laughs> I'm not watching the news with you anymore. <laughs> well, I mean, he finds it interesting. So it... And I think it's it's been a really good thing to to bring out in in the public sphere a little bit more about that modeling because it's always been there in the background of every health decision that was made but now it's become really important to all of us particularly in in states where it's been slightly higher numbers um like you know i mean canberra it's been quite low as well so it's um i think it's a really good focus on science and the scientists so we do so yeah i, I mean it has been really good to see mathematical modeling discussed so widely in the community even if it's not always in a positive light at least it's being talked about too. All, all publicity is good publicity <laughs> that's, what, that's what they say well, thank you for joining us this afternoon, Roslyn, and thank all of you for being in the audience. And I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have listening to what you do and how you apply maths to real world problems that have actually affected a lot of us in the last 18 months to two years. So don't forget, you're going to get sent a survey after this. If you could fill it out, that would be great for us. But please um, join us at our next talk. We've got one next week on Tuesday, I believe, and another one Thursday, the week after. And we will have a whole series of talks into next year. So teachers who are watching, watch our emails and we will let you know who's talking up next. So thank you very much.